So the first two exercises in the enzyme lab are going to kind of require you to do a little internet sleuthing on your own. Basically what you need to know is we're searching for uh, an answer to the following question. What effect or effects do environmental conditions have on the enzymatic activity of lactase. Okay? And the two environmental conditions we're really looking at here are going to be temperature pH. So we want to ask the question, what effects will these have on enzymatic activity? And remember, the way that we are measuring enzymatic activity is by the amount of glucose that's produced. Because the better the enzyme is working, the higher the activity, the more glucose you're going to produce. Okay? So recall that in the temperature exercise, what you did was you took a test tube, an Eppendorf tube, and into that tube, you first added lactase. Then you put that tube at some temp. Okay, for five minutes. Then after that, you added milk. After adding milk, you let that tube sit in there for 10 minutes at that temp. So you're at the temp for 10 minutes. And then after that, what you did was you took your glucose test strip you dipped it into that Eppendorf tube for a second, you pulled it out, you let it sit on your bench top, and you let it develop for um, either 30 seconds or a minute depending upon which lab you were in. Okay. Once that glucose test strip developed, it told you how much glucose existed inside this tube. And remember, that directly correlates to lactase activity. So let's talk about the different temperatures that we looked at. Okay. So remember, we did a tube that was 0, one that was 25, one that was 40, one that was 60, one that was 80, and one that was 100 degrees. And let's talk about what we expected to see in each of these tubes. So first off, if you did your internet research, you would have found, or even if you just thought about it, um, for your hypotheses, if you think about where lactase is used, we use it, okay, if we have it, and our core body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 37 degrees Celsius, which is very, very close to 40 degrees. So a lot of students hypothesized that 40 would be what is known as the optimal temperature, which is the best temperature at which it, the enzyme performs its duties the best. That is, its activity and its ability to bind the substrate and speed up the rate of that reaction um, is the greatest. Okay? So at 40 degrees, what we found in most instances was we had higher levels of glucose, very, very, very high levels of glucose. Okay? Most of my students saw somewhat high, and I'll give you numeric values here in a second, levels of glucose at 25. So that suggests that this reaction is proceeding at a much faster rate than it was at some of the other temperatures. Okay? 60. Um, we also saw somewhat high. And then here's what a lot of people saw. People saw some glucose at zero, but they saw pretty low levels. While most people at 80 and 100 saw either low glucose or no glucose. Okay, so let's talk about why. 
First off, this looking the way it does hopefully makes sense. Our body temperature is 37 degrees. We utilize this enzyme. This enzyme has an optimal temperature, or optimum temperature, however you like to say it, 40 or thereabouts, because it's going to be utilized um, in our bodies, and it's going to function best at a temperature close to our body temperature. Okay. Now we notice that it drops off on either side here, most likely because, again, these are not the optimal temperatures. But it's still functioning, and enzymes can function at temperatures that are below or above the optimal temperature within a certain range. But notice that once we get out to 80 and 100, we start to see a decline in the amount of glucose that's produced, which means a reduction in enzymatic activity. And we see the same thing happen over here at zero. Okay, so if I were to do a graphical representation of this whole thing, here's our glucose, here are our temperatures, what you would see in the graphical representation is probably something along these lines. Okay, so again, I see the peak here. That means it's my optimal temperature. Okay, now let's talk about why we see the decline here and there. Okay, first off, think about what's happening to molecular movement at zero degrees Celsius. There's not a lot of kinetic energy. The molecules are moving incredibly slow. Okay, there's also not a lot of thermal energy there because it's so cold. So the molecules are moving so slow that these reactions are just proceeding at a very, very, very slow rate. So the reactions are still happening, the enzyme is still functional, but the molecules are just moving way too slow. Okay? Now, think about what happens here at 80 and here at 100. Okay? We see a decrease in activity, and that decrease is not due to the same cause as here. Once you start to get into the higher temperatures, you begin to destabilize the bonds in your enzyme. Your enzyme begins to unfold. So we unfold the enzyme. Okay? This is referred to scientifically as denaturation. The reason you're not seeing a lot of glucose at these two temperatures is because the enzyme has unfolded and no longer is in a functional state. So it can no longer bind the substrate and it can no longer perform its function. So functional enzyme, but the molecules are moving too slowly versus non-functional enzyme because it's been denatured. Okay? So understand that, the difference between those two. All right, so that's temperature. Let's talk very briefly about pH because we saw something relatively similar here in pH. All right, so for pH, we had pH values of 2, 7, and 12. Okay, and the way that this worked was very similar to your temperature. Basically, what you did was you added an acid, a base, or a neutral solution to one of those test tubes that contains your lactase or milk. Then you added your enzyme to it. And then you let it sit and incubate for 10 minutes, just like all of the other tubes. And at the end of it, we dipped that glucose strip back in, and we tested to see what the amount of glucose was in each of these. And a lot of people hypothesized that this would actually be the optimal pH, because most of the time they were thinking, OK, if we take lactase as a supplemental tablet, or if we drink milk, where does it go first? It goes to the stomach. So a lot of people said, OK, I hypothesized then that the optimal pH of lactase will be a pH of 2. What we found was that the optimal or optimum pH of lactase was actually 7. And here's why. Lactase is utilized primarily in our small intestine, which has a pH that's much closer to 7 than it is to 2 or 12. In fact, what most groups saw was that 2 and 12, there wasn't even a slight amount of enzymatic activity there was no enzymatic activity. 
which if I were to draw this out in a graphical representation, here's glucose, here's my pH scale from 0 to, 12, uh, to 14, 7 smack dab in the middle. What I would probably see if I had done all the pHs and what we're getting from this is a curve that looks something like this. Okay, again, uppermost value is going to be your optimal or optimum pH. Okay, now, as opposed to temperature, where at zero degrees, the molecules are moving too slowly, in most instances with pH, when you go too far below or too far above the optimum pH, the reason you see a decrease in enzymatic activity is almost always due to denaturation of the enzyme or an inability of the enzyme to bind to its substrate because of those particular pHs and the ions that are found in them. Okay. So this is the pH exercise. So we've done two now optimal pH and optimal temperature. Ideally, to get the most bang for your buck with your enzyme, that is to generate the most amount of product and therefore have the highest enzymatic activity, what we would ideally do is we would get a situation or a scenario set up where we have both the optimum pH and the optimum temperature utilized. And our enzyme then would be able to have the highest level of enzymatic activity and we would make the largest amount of product we possibly could. Okay, so that's that.